This is the motto of the show, Hour of the Truth. Rome never changes. They used to call us heretics and sent the Inquisition to kill us. Today they call us terrorists and send on their crusades. Times and methods may have changed, the goal still stays the same. Extirpate the remnant of the true word of God, Bible believing people. Suffering at the hands of Rome Cause they believed in Christ alone They died through Europe, especially Spain For they saw all but Christ as vain He suffered by His death for men To save them from their awful sin Six hundred years of martyred saints that history cannot erase With iron heel and iron hand The Roman popes rule the land Those ignorant of history May be swept into apostasy We won't be loved by Rome, sweet lie with 50 million reasons why Salvation is by faith alone In Christ alone, by grace alone A sovereign God give faith to man Salvation's in the Maker's hand This gospel offends Rome today They offer up Another way, a counterfeit, a compromise Beware the ancient papal lie With such a cloud of witnesses Who by grace died in their Lord Recall their memory to say By the same faith we live today Hello and welcome everybody to a new video from Joggler66, War on Disinformation and Hour of the Truth. This is the next uh, session of the reading of the book History of the Inquisition by Philip from Limborch, written in the end of the, ne of the 17th century and translated into English in the starting of the 18th century, as you probably all know by now. We have come to Volume 2 and uh, as I explained last time, I'm going to choose to read the more difficult to read uh, volume that I have here in the PDF because as we have seen last time in comparison to the other one the brother of Christ sent me um, this is not a, a, a abridged version I think the other one even is a more abridged version so without any further ado let us continue we have been come to page 41 in uh, volume 2 chapter 8 uh, chapter 7 sorry the persecutions of the popes against heretics and this is a very short chapter but on the other hand of course the whole book deals with the same subject the persecutions of the roman catholic church against quote unquote heretics what they say heretics or define as heretics but you know, I said that already in the very beginning. So without any further ado, let us just continue reading this chapter 7, The Persecution of the Popes Against Heretics. In the following ages, the affairs of the Church were so managed under the government of the Popes and all persons so strictly curbed by the severity of the laws that they durst not even so much as whisper against the received opinions of the Church. Besides this, so deep was the ignorance that had spread itself over the world that men without the least regard to knowledge and learning received with a blind obedience everything that the ecclesiastics ordered them, however stupid and superstitious, without any examination. And if anyone dared in the least to contradict them, 
he was sure immediately to be punished, whereby the most absurd opinions came to be established by the violence of the popes. It was at this time that the doctrine of transubstantiation was introduced into the church, now in everything subject to the Pope's back. And how dangerous it was to oppose it, we may learn from the instance of Berengarius of Tours, Archdeacon of Angiers, who, teaching that the bread and wine in the supper was only the figure of the body and blood of the Lord, was condemned as an heretic by Antichrist Pope Leo IX in a synod in Rome at Rome and Vercella in the year 1050, and five years after, meaning 1055, was forced to recant and to subscribe with his own hand to the faith of the Roman Church and confirm it with an oath by Victor II in the Council of Tours. But as Berengarius his recantation was forced, and as he afterwards defended that opinion, which in his heart he believed, Nicholas II called a council at the Lateran, anno 1059, and there again condemned Berengarius and compelled him to make a solemn abjuration, which Berengarius publicly read and signed with his own hand. This was that famous abjuration which begins Ergo Berengarius. Thus was the truth suppressed by the papal violence. In the East also, anno 1118, one Basilius, the author of the sect of Bongomili, was publicly burned for heresy by the command of Alexius Comnenus, Comnenus the emperor, as Baronius relates, anno 1118. Now, let me just make a little comment on the dogma of transubstantiation that we hear here for the very first time in, in this book, The History of the Inquisition. <clears throat> it doesn't say in which years that exactly came, but we see that this was about, around the year 1000 to 1050, when this quote-unquote heretic Berengarius opposed the doctrine of transubstantiation. Now let's fast forward a little five, 500 years. Yeah? From 1050, uh, 500 years fast forward, we come to 1550. Uh, 1550, that is five years after the starting of the Council of Trent, the diabolical Anti-Reformation Council of Trent that took place between 1545 and 1563. Three different sessions interrupted uh, always for a few years, uh, but three different sessions within these 18 years that the Council took place. From the start and even to the beginning, and you can read that of course in the, uh, in the annals of the Council of Trent, in the documented uh, records of the Council of Trent, it is repeated all over again that the dogma of the transubstantiation stands within the Roman Catholic Church, meaning that a priester, a Roman Catholic priester, by saying the hocus pocus words hoc est corpus enem meum, he commands Jesus Christ from heaven to descend into that little wafer bread and by that becoming I'm going to show you a picture of transubstantiation in the meantime and by that becoming or may he the, the, the priest creates by that um, the body and soul and flesh and blood and divinity of Jesus Christ, our Savior, in that transubstantiation. So, finally the computer works a little slow, I can't help it, sorry, but this is it. So only in the superstitious Roman Catholic belief system, a creature can recreate the Creator by ordering Jesus Christ from heaven down into this little 
quote-unquote Jesus cookie, as I like to call it. That's an expression I got from Tom Fress. Where the Roman Catholic priest or priest orders Jesus Christ with this Latin words hoc est corpus enem meum from heaven into that little bread and that little bread absolutely becomes the soul, divinity, humanity, blood and flesh of Jesus Christ. That's what they teach. Whereas Jesus Christ taught in the Bible that we should break this bread and drink this wine in remembrance of him. And in the Council of Trent it is stated very clearly, everybody who says that you, uh, that you are doing that in remembrance of him, let him be anathema. So this is absolutely a, a point that you cannot overcome. You cannot even discuss about. You cannot even... You, 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 how can you make a compromise about that? How can any of the quote-unquote Protestant churches who say that they adhere to sola scriptura, how can any of these churches say we are doing the communion in the spirit as Jesus Christ commanded us and do that in remembrance of him when the Roman Catholic Church says when you do that in remembrance of him you are anathema how can these two come together well I can answer that they can't except the Protestants forget what the Bible really says and they don't care about what the Bible really says and they adhere to the Roman Catholic Church which says our tradition stands above the Bible. And when the Pope says, the Bible says thus, but the Pope says so, then it is so and not thus. That's why in the Bible it is written, thus the Lord said, right? So, the dogma of transubstantiation. This is a very, very important little, but very important point to understand. There cannot be a compromise with the Roman Catholic Church on the quote-unquote Jesus cookie, when they say this is the actual divinity, body, soul, blood and flesh of Jesus Christ and humanity, and humanity of Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ himself says, do this in remembrance of me. And when you say, I do this in remembrance of him, as Jesus commands me, the Roman Catholic Church just says, then you are anathema. Now think about this, and this is one of the one of the absolute reasons why this uh, in Inquisition was introduced also. Because the Mass, the constantly re... Um, how, how, how are we going to say that? Re-sacrificing. Uh, the constant re-sacrificing of Jesus Christ is the basis of the Roman Catholic Church. And the dogma of transubstantiation belongs to that 100% and they will never ever go away from that standpoint. So you have to accept their standpoint and by that you are sacrificing Jesus Christ over and over again. Whereas he went to the cross once and was the perfect lamb and fulfilled all prophecies of the Old Testament in going to the cross. He did it once and for all. And when you take part in, the, part in the Roman Catholic Mass and participate in the quote-unquote communion in the Roman Catholic Mass with the transubstantiation, you are sacrificing Jesus Christ over and over and over again. This is why this is such an important point we have to make here. Okay? So I'm going to continue reading, but I hope, I hope really that you understood me very good and if you have any questions on this please write them in the comment section of the uh, of, of the video and we can talk about this but when you even go to uh, the different papers the Council of Trent uh, put out there is this one and I, I have that book even here in uh, in my home about the Catechism of the Council of Trent, as you can see here. Yeah? 
the Catechism of the Council of Trent. I got that book right here. There they explain into detail everything that I just explained to you. And there they say that when you say, I take the bread and the wine in remembrance of Jesus Christ, then you are anathema. Whether you like it or not, that's what they say. They, the Roman Catholic Church, the synagogue of Satan. Let's make that sure. But continuing in the last paragraph, or last but one paragraph on the same page here. In the meantime, the power of the Roman pontiff grew to a prodigious height and began to be very troublesome even to the emperors themselves. For not content with the ecclesiastical power, they claimed also the subjection of the secular. But in the midst of this thick darkness, some glimmerings of light broke forth through the great mercy of God. For after the year of Christ 1100, there arose various disputes between the emperors and popes about the papal power in secular affairs, which, as they were managed with great warmth, gave occasion to many more strictly to examine that unbounded power with the popes of Rome claimed to themselves. Some so the emperors some of the emperors bravely maintained their rights against the papal encroachments and were supported not only by the arms and forces of generals and, uh, and princes, but by bishops and divines who strenuously wrote in their defense. Now, before we go any further, one of these examples, and this is a little bit for the year 1000, is... Um, uh, the the example of uh, the German emperor who went to Canossa. Yeah. Uh, when when you when you study that Canossa, this is uh, I, I I don't come to his <laughs> to the name right now. Let me see. I have a picture of that, of course. Um, Canossa, yeah, the Gang nach Canossa. Yeah, I I know it in German, but not that well in. Uh, in English, <laughs> what's it called here? Uh, no, no, I don't find it under under Canossa. Um, maybe it's under Henry because I thought it was Henry the third or, or something in, in German. Here, go to Canossa. Henry the fourth. This is it. Henry the fourth. Uh, uh, on, on his way to Canossa. So this is the Pope and this is Henry IV. And Henry IV did take some uh, other points than the Roman Catholic Church, than the Pope, uh, even uh, put some bishops into power uh, without asking the Pope. And by that the Pope made him anathema. Yeah? He condemned him outside of the Church. And... Um, when he repented, uh, let's say, when he wanted to pay penance, Henry IV, um, he went to Canossa and asked the Pope for forgiveness. That's what this is all about here. And that has nothing to do with the transubstantiation, but it has to do with the struggle of the emperors, because Henry IV was an emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, that was the struggle between the emperors on the one hand and the pope on the other hand, that the pope said, the spiritual power is above the temporal power. I, the pope, represent the spiritual and the temporal power, and you are just a puppet, you, emperor, are just a puppet of mine for the secular power. But I have it all. That's because the Vatican flag has two keys the silver key representing the temporal power and the golden key representing the spiritual power and the golden key lays over the silver key so the spiritual is above the temporal power also something we spoke about an hour of the truth when i read the paper of uh, martin luther 1520 on the roman uh, on the on the german nobility and at this moment in 2017, you can go to First Amendment Radio and go to the latest uh, playlist of Tom Fress, uh, something called like Luther in his own words. 
where Tom Press starts analyzing that paper too and uh, for the moment even reads uh, of the Babylonian captivity and he comes to exactly the same points and he makes the same points that there is a big struggle between is the temporal power subject to the spiritual power well the Pope says yes and the people of course who hold secular power don't agree and when they don't agree you have a problem and then you have to go to make regime ch regime changes where this is not accepted that's why the Americans go with their military power all over the world, everywhere, to uh, put in regimes that accept that the spiritual is above the temporal power. That's the restoration of the old world order, which so many people call the new world order, and there's only to do with the acceptance that uh, the spiritual power is above the temporal. Easy as that. And we are just reading about that here in this book, so let's continue. But I think that this is a very important point that we just want uh, want to make here. Yeah? This spirited up many others to oppose that unbounded authority, yeah? unbounded authority, ultramontanism, you know, the absolute power in the hands of one man, the Pope. And of course, in 1303, you know that Pope Boniface VIII said that it is absolutely necessary for every human, for the salvation of every human creature to be subject to the Roman Pontiff. That is unbounded authority. This spirited up many others to oppose that unbounded authority, which the popes assumed in matters of faith, who not only argued that they were capable of erring, as well as the other bishops, but actually pointed out and censured their many errors and abuses of their unlimited power. All these the court of Rome banded with the infamous name of heretics and would have made the sacrifice to the public hatred. They appeared first in some parts of Italy, but principally in the Milanese and Lombardy. And because they dwelt in different cities, and had their particular instructors, the papists, to render them to more odious, have represented them as different sects, and ascribed to them as different opinions, though others affirm they all held the same opinions, and were entirely of the same sect. The truth is, that from the oldest accounts of them we shall find that they did not hold all the same tenets, and were not of the same sect though neither their opinions nor sects were so many and different as the papists represent. The principal of them were Tanquilinius, Petrus de Bruy, Petrus Abilardus, Arnaldus Brixianus, whose opinion Baronius calls the heresy of the politicians. <laughs> That's an interesting expression. The heresy of the politicians. <laughs> Hendricus and others who preached partly in Italy and partly in France about the country of Toulouse. And because afterwards the greater number of them propagated their opinions in the provinces of Albejois, in Languedoc, and gathered their large and numerous churches who openly professed their faith, they were titled Albigenses. And that leaves us into the next chapter, which is called Of the Albigenses and Valdenses. And whether you write Valdenses as it is written here with a V or with a W, that doesn't matter, it's the same. You will also come across the name of the Vaudois, V A U D O I S, Vaudois, that's the French version of the Valdenses. And the Albigenses from the city of Albi. And the Waldenses, so uh, as, as they say, founded by Waldo, were living, were people living in the south of France, in the Languedoc region. The Languedoc is the region from the border from Spain. Actually, you can almost trace it until almost the border of Italy, on the Mediterranean coast. Yeah, that's the region that you have over there. And uh, the city of Elbi is a little bit above that. So that's in that region. It's also called the Piedmont. Yeah? 
in the region of the Piedmont, where living at those times the Albigenses and the Valdenses. And if you ask me, and I'm not going too deep into that right now, because we are going to continue reading this book in the next chapter 8 now, but if you ask me, these people are actually the ones that flew Rome from persecution. That was the actual true church that Paul founded in Rome, and when they got persecuted, they fled into the north of Italy and the south of France to survive there. And if you ask me, those are the foundations of the Albigenses and of the Waldenses. And the book of Revelation speaks about that in the time of the persecution, the 1260 days, the three and a half years, the 42 months, a place was prepared for the church in the wilderness. And that wilderness is not only the Languedoc and the Piedmont uh, region, but also the foots and even the tops of the Alps, of the, uh, of the mountains of the Alps, which is also in the same region. And in that wilderness the church hid during the hard persecution of the Antichrist for 1260 years. And we are reading now, or going to continue read now, in the time of uh, 1000 plus AD. And we will see that then the Albigenses and Waldenses were highly, uh, severely persecuted by the Roman Catholic Church. Of course, that is an, another kind of the Inquisition. Yeah? When the Roman Catholic Church went even out to crusades against these Protestants, about these people who did not accept the dogma of transubstantiation on the one hand, and who did not accept all the other teachings of the Roman Catholic Church, and of course not the Pope being the vicar of Christ, but they had their Christ, the Christ of the Bible, they were persecuted. And this is what we are talking about in the upcoming chapter on the Valdenses and... Um, <clears throat> uh, of the Valdenses and the Albigenses. So we are reading this right here now. So, about the same time, the Valdenses, we start reading chapter 8 now, or the poor men of Lyon, appeared at Lyon, whose original hath been largely shown by the most reverend and learned Usher, Archbishop of Arnac, in his book, The Successione, in chapter 8. I shall, <coughs> sorry, I shall therefore only inquire whether the Valdenses and Albigenses were the same people, according to the common opinion of Protestants, or different from one another. It's interesting, huh? We are speaking about the Albigenses and the Valdenses, and the question is, are we speaking about the same people? <coughs> Or are we speaking about two different people? Well, <clears throat> let me put it this way. Spiritually, we are talking about the same. Temporally, we are talking about two different people. It cannot be doubted, the author continues, but that they had some opinions in common. But there is nothing more evident than that there was amongst them a great variety of doctrines and difference of rites and customs, as appears from the book of the Sentences of the Inquisition at Toulouse, which I have published, in which are to be found many of the sentences pronounced against the Albigenses and Valdenses, which discover some very curious and uncommon things concerning their doctrines and rites and which are such evident proofs of their differences in opinion and customs, that from the reading of a few lines one may easily know that whether the sentence pronounced was against the Albigenses or against the Valdenses, which manifest different, uh, which manifest difference hath induced me to believe that they were two distinct sects, though I have hitherto been in the common opinion that they were but one. And that this may appear more clearly, I shall here give out of the book of sentences the doctrines common to both, and those in which they differed, and describe their particular rites and customs. The opinions common to them both were these. 
every oath is unlawful and sinful, and therefore they would never upon any occasion take an oath. And this is of course confirmed by the Bible, because Jesus Christ says in the New Testament, don't take an oath, let your yea be yea and your nay be nay. Now, concerning penance and the confession of sins, the Albigenses, the Albigenses are said to believe that confession made to the priests of the Church of Rome signifies nothing, that neither the Pope nor any other of the Church of Rome can absolve anyone from his sins, but that they have the power of absolving from their sins all those who become to their sect by the imposition of hands. Almost the same things are ascribed to the Valdenses, that they reach, <coughs> oh, sorry, that they teach, that they have power from God only, even as the apostles had, of confessing men and women of their sins who believe them and are willing to confess to them, that they hear their confessions and enjoin them penance for their sins, although these who hear their confessions are not ordained by the church are not priests or clerks, but laics, meaning lay people only. And though they confess that they have not in the least received his power from the Church of Rome. And farther in most of the sentences against the Valdenses we find that they confessed their sins to one of the Valdenses and received absolution and penance from him and believed that, he, that the said confession and absolution and penance as much availed to the salvation of the soul as though they had been confessed to a proper priest. But their doctrine is best understood by the sentence of Yugueta, the wife of John of Vienna, that God only can absolve from sins and that he who receives confession can only advise that a man ought to do and enjoin penance, and that a wise and prudent person may do this, whether he be a priest or not. Well, the very first sentence of this last quote is the most important. That's why I'm going to highlight it and going to explain to you why I highlight it. God only can absorb from sin. So when the priest says that he can absolve you from sin because the power has been given to him by the Pope, which is also only a mere man, and the Pope says that he can absolve from sin, he makes himself God. And the Pope, of course, makes every priest a God. Right? That is the dogma of the Roman Catholic Church. Now, God only can absolve from sin. When you have sinned, you can only go to Jesus Christ and tell him about your sins and ask him for forgiveness, for forgiveness of your sins. And that's the point of a real protestant. We are not to confess our sins to our brothers and sisters in Christ. We are to go to our brothers and sisters in Christ and speak of our sins errors and mistakes that we have done but we are not to confess our sins to one another we are to confess our sins to him who can forgive the sins which is Jesus Christ with which, with, with, uh, which is our father in heaven he and he alone can forgive sins no man can forgive sins so when a man cannot forgive sins why should you even confess your sins to a man? Right, you don't. So I don't care what the author says here about the Waldensis practices or the Albigensis practices. I'm going to tell you what is biblical. You can confess each other's trespasses, each other's errors and, and, and things you have done wrong. But sins you can only confess to God and only God will take away your sins. So continue. As to the Church of Rome, the Albigenses are said to believe that there, that there are two churches, one merciful, meaning theirs and the Church of Christ, which retains that faith in which everyone and without which no one can be saved. The other, a cruel 
one, which is the Church of Rome, which is the mother of fornications, the temple of the devil and synagogue of Satan, and that no one can be saved in the faith of that church. And elsewhere we read that no man can be saved that is not received by them, and unless he die of their sect. The Waldenses are said to have taught almost the same things. That they, that they cannot be excommunicated by the Pope, <laughs> neither can I. <laughs> oh no, it's here. Um, uh, sorry, I, I took the wrong line here. That they are not subject to the Roman Pontiff, nor to the prelates of the Church of Rome. Very important sentence. You know, only when you are a subject to the Pope of Rome, the Pope can force laws and persecutions and everything on you. But you should not be a subject to the Pope of Rome because you are a subject of Jesus Christ as a born-again Christian. But of course we are living here in this temporal, fleshly, carnal world that makes that point a little bit difficult to come to. Repeat that sentence again. The Waldenses are said to have taught almost the same things. That they are not subject to the Roman Pontiff, nor to the prelates of the Church of Rome. That they cannot be excommunicated by the Pope nor the other prelates of that church, that they ought not to obey the Pope when he commands them to forsake and abjure their sect, as condemned by the church, that the church of Rome sins and acts lawful, unlawfully and unjustly against them, because it persecutes and condemns them, and that their father taught that the prelates of the Church of Rome are blind leaders of the blind, do not preserve the truth of the gospel, nor initiate the apostol apostolic poverty, and that the very Church of Rome is an house of lies. Yeah, I think I have to highlight this whole last part of the paragraph here, and I'm going to give it even another color to make it more uh, obvious that this is a very important part that we have just been reading. You know, I cannot express too much the importance of what we have just read here. The Valdenses said that they ought not to obey the Pope. No, because you cannot serve two masters. You can whether obey the Pope or you can obey Jesus Christ when he commands them to forsake and abjure their sect as condemned by the church. Well, that church, the Roman Catholic Church in this case, condemns their sect because they adhere to sola scriptura, and the Roman Catholic Church does not. That the Church of Rome sins and acts unlawfully and unjustly against them because it persecutes and condemns them. A very important sentence, right? Because persecution is not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that we are to fight with the two-edged sword of the word of God, not with a carnal sword, and that we have to convince people by the word of God that they are unjustly and unrighteous and unlawful, and not like the Church of Rome that acts unlawfully and unjustly because it persecutes and condemns these people. With condemning I mean calling them anathema uh, and uh, excommunicating them. But of course, when you are not even part of the Roman Catholic Church, because you are part of the body of Christ, they can excommunicate you as long as they want. It doesn't have any effect on you. That's also why Martin Luther burned his bull of excommunication openly in the fire. Because he said, I don't care what the Antichrist does with it, because I'm not under his jurisdiction. And of course, the Pope thinks otherwise about the juris jurisdiction. And again we read in this little last sentence here, and that they father taught, the Valdenses, 
that the prelates of the Church of Rome are blind leaders of the blind. What happens with the blind man who leads other blind men? They both fall into the ditch, right? And why are they blind? Because they do not have the light, which is the word, which, which is the Bible, which is the truth of Jesus Christ. They do not preserve the truth of the gospel, nor initiate the apostolic poverty. And that the very church of Rome is an house of lies. I really think this is a very important little paragraph that we read here. And on this <coughs> sorry. And on this little paragraph alone I could probably make one, two or even three hours of video on itself. But I'm not gonna do that now because we are going to continue reading in this book. But I hope that you understand the severeness, the earnestness and the, and, 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 the, and the importance of this last little paragraph. Sorry. So, I'm going to continue this paragraph once again before we go to the next page and read on in the book. The Valdensis said that they ought not to obey the Pope when he commands them to forsake and abjure their sect, as condemned by the Church, that the Church of Rome sins and acts unlawfully and unjustly against the Valdenses because it persecutes and condemns them, and that they farther taught that the prelates of the Church of Rome are blind leaders of the blind, do not preserve the truth of the Gospel, nor initiate the apostolic poverty, and that the very Church of Rome is an house of lies. The opinions that are ascribed to the Albigenses, but never to the Valdenses, are these. Quote, that there are two gods and lords, the one god, the other evil that the creation of all things visible and corporeal was not from God our Heavenly Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, but the devil and Satan, the evil God who is the God of this world and the maker and prince of it, which they express elsewhere in this manner, that it was not God that caused the earth to yield seed and bring forth fruits, and elsewhere that the good God made all things invisible and incorruptible, and that the evil prince, meaning Lucifer, made all things visible and corruptible, and even humane bodies. And in another place, that there were two gods, one good, the other bad, and that the bad god created all things visible. Now, this is of course something that I do not, not ascribe to. The... Um, let's say, uh, the dogma or the opinions ascribed to the Albigenses. Um, I absolutely do not agree with that. Yeah. There is one God who made the heavens and the earth, and that is Jesus Christ. Through him everything was made, yeah. and nothing else. That it is not Satan. Satan didn't create anything because Satan was a created being. So I absolutely disagree with what the Albigenses teach here. But yeah, you know, they maybe say sola scriptura, but they are not 100% adhering to the Bible and the Bible alone, as we can read here that there were two gods, one good and the other bad, and that the bad God created all things visible. Now, what does the Bible say? The Bible says there is one God. Yeah? The Israelites in the Old Testament say, oh, it's Here, O Israel, our God is one God. There is only one God. There is not two. There is not one good and one bad. There is only one God. And that is the creator God of the Bible. Satan is not a god. Satan is a created being. He is a fallen angel. 
oh, people maybe make him God and he is quote unquote God of this world because the Bible says that Satan is the God of this world. I will, of course, not go against the Bible, but we have to understand how they mean that. They mean it in the Bible that he is the quote unquote God of this world because the people adhere to him and give praise to him rather than to the Creator. That's the point. So I, of course, don't agree with anything that the Albigenses teach here or the opinions that are ascribed to the Albigenses here. I think I will be more a Waldense than a Waldenser than an Albigenser in that case. Now, since these things are to be met within the sentence of Petrus Auterius, Auterius sorry, one of their fame, uh, one of their famous, famous doctors, famous must that be, I, I guess. Since these things are to be met with the sentence of Petrus Auterius, one of their famous doctors, I am apt to think not only that some of the Manichaeans who were banished from Elsia and came to Bulgaria and afterwards went to the country of Toulouse lurked among them, but that they had many of them at least embraced the Manichaean opinions. And indeed we ought not to conceal the truth. For although they are to be commanded for having discovered many of the Romish errors in doctrine, and for their forsaking the communion of their church, yet we ought ingeniously to own their mistakes. And as their recommending to those they received into their communion, what they called the endura, i.e. The, uh, the fasting themselves to death, was certainly an error in practice for that we need not be ashamed to own that they sometimes erred in methods, uh, matters of faith. It is rather to be wondered at, that in so barbarous an age they should throw off so many errors than that they should retain some. But besides, they are, uh, they are said also to have held the following opinions, that all the sacraments of the Church of Rome are vain and unprofitable, the Eucharist, which is the dogma of the transubstantiation in the Mass, baptism, confirmation, order and extreme unction. Because the Bible only speaks about two quote-unquote sacraments, and I won't, won't even call them sacraments. When we are speaking about baptism of the Bible and when we are speaking about communion, those are the two quote-unquote sacraments of the Bible. But those aren't sacraments, those are holy ordained um, actions, in lack of a better word for this moment, we have to do, or we can do. Yeah? I don't even agree with the word sacrament here, because that comes from the Roman Catholic Church. And they have also held that these uh, opinions of the Roman Catholic Church are, of course, unscriptural. Absolutely. So let's see, the author is getting here a little bit more into detail. As to the Eucharist, they are reported to have believed, quote, that there was not the body of Christ and that there was nothing but mere bread. Absolutely. This is the refutation of the dogma of transubstantiation. This is is only a piece of bread. There, it is not the body of Christ. And this goes against the Roman Catholic teaching of the dogma of transubstantiation. As to the baptisms, the author continues, quote, that they condemned the baptism of water, saying that a man was to be saved by their laying on of hands upon those who believed them, and that their sins were to be remitted without confession and satisfaction that no baptism availed anything, no, not their own. We read also in the sentence of Petrus Raimundus Dominicus de Borno that he heard Peter Oteri teaching, amongst other things, that the baptism of water made by the church was of no avail to children because they were so far from consenting to it that they wept. And I agree with this very last sentence. Quote, the baptism of water made by the Church of Rome was of no avail to children 
because they were so far from consenting to it that they wept. A child cannot make up his own mind and cannot choose Jesus Christ yet, and therefore baptism of a child is absolutely unbiblical. Baptism is the outward sign of being saved for us. And whether you can agree with or disagree with the baptism of water, because the Bible says um, you can only enter into the kingdom of heaven when you are baptized by water and the Spirit, I'm not so sure about that water uh, baptism also, because sometimes you just don't have the possibility to get baptized by water. And I here in Belgium don't have the possibility right now to get baptized by water. Maybe when my Dutch friend Perry once again comes to visit me, we will have the possibility that he can baptize me in the name of Jesus Christ, but I'm not sure about that. In the meantime, I think that I am saved by accepting Jesus Christ as my Savior and doing his works, what I'm doing with reading and explaining this book here. You know, I confessed my sins to him, I, I gave my life to him. And I think this is what being born again also means. And that this baptism of water is just a mere work. That, of course, when you have the possibility, you gladly do. But when you don't have the possibility, I do not think it is a salvation point. Being saved by the Spirit is, to me, the most important thing. And I think we have to adhere to that. So, as to the baptisms, they said here that the baptism of water made by the Church of Rome was of no avail to children because they were so far from consenting to it that they wept. And I agree. As to extreme unction, uh, this is also something that is not uh, spoken about in the Bible. In the Bible it says that um, we are to, to pray for the sick, not for the dead. <laughs> Uh, big difference. As to extreme unction, the author says that the order of St. James or extreme unction upon the sick made by material oil signified nothing, and that they prefer imposition of hands with the inquisitor, with which the inquisitors call execrable. As to orders, that they reproach and condemn the constitution of the whole Church of Rome and deny all the prelates of, its, uh, of it the power of binding and losing, saying that they cannot lose or bind other sinners since they themselves are greater sinners, but that they can give to those they receive the Holy Spirit in order to their salvation. As to matrimony, marriage, quote, that it is always sinful and cannot be without sin, and never uh, and was never appointed by the good God. Also, the carnal matrimony between a man and woman is not true matrimony, nor good, nor lawful, nor appointed by God, but a quite different spiritual matrimony. I, of course, do not agree for obvious reasons that we don't have to go deeper into here. As to the incarnation of Christ, that the Lord did not take a real humane body, nor real humane flesh of our nature, and that he did not really arise with it, nor do other things relating to our salvation, nor sit down at the right hand of the Father with it, but only with the likeness of it. Well, this is what I call heresy. Huh? Because this goes into everything the Bible teaches. The Lord did not take real humane, uh, uh, a real humane body or real humane flesh in our nature. In the book of John we read that the, flesh be uh, that the world became flesh and, uh, and, and, and uh, dwelt among us. Yeah? So this is absolutely against the Bible. And that, they did not, uh, and that he did not really arise with it. No, of course he arose, because he said to Thomas at that moment, Touch me, feel me, yeah? feel my hands and see that I am it, uh, that I am him. So, of course, this is against the Bible, absolutely against the Bible, that he did not really arise with it, nor do other things relating to our salvation, nor sit down at the right hand of the Father with it, but only with the likeness of it. So, I absolutely disagree with the um, politics 
of what we are reading here <coughs> of the Albigenses. Yeah? As to the incarnation of Christ, we just read this one. They affirm also, the author continues, that the most holy Virgin Mary, <coughs> the mother of our Lord, neither is nor was a carnal woman, but that church, which they say is true penitence, and that this is the Virgin Mary. Or, as we read elsewhere, that God never entered into the womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary, and that he only is the mother and brother and sister of God that keeps the commands of God the Father. Likewise, that it was impossible for God to be incarnate, because he never humbled himself so much as to put himself in the womb of a woman. Uh, this is really getting into my nerves. This is so apostate, so against the Bible, I do not even know where to start making comments. So I'll save it for myself. I just ask you all to take your own discernment with what I've just read. Take your Bible next to you and compare what they teach here. Compare that to the Bible. Concerning the resurrection of the dead, they are charged with denying the resurrection of bodies, or there will be no future resurrection of human bodies, and although the souls of men shall come to judgment and shall not come in their, uh, they shall not come in their bodies, which is elsewhere more distinctly explained, that they imagine a sort of spiritual bodies and a sort of an inward man, in which bodies performs are hereafter to rise. One of the Albigenses is said to have believed that when the souls of wicked men are gone out of their bodies before and after judgment, they go through the buffies and los tertres, i.e. over rocks and precipices, and that the devil throws them headlong from the rocks. So that's their kind of purgatory, I guess. Also, that the souls of men, even after their separation from the body, have flesh and bones, hands and feet, and all members, which, though they are thrown by the devil's headlong from the rocks, and by this means tormented, yet can never die. As to the adoration of the cross, that no man ought to adore the cross, which is another place which in another place is very odiously represented, meaning that the sign of the Holy Cross, which the Universal Church worships as the emblem of our salvation and the representation of our Lord's Passion, is a detestable emblem of the devil. And the reason of this is added elsewhere, that the cross of Christ ought to be adored, because no man worships the gallows upon which his father was hanged. Yeah, I agree with this last sentence. And the reason of this is added elsewhere, that the cross of Christ ought not to be adored, because no man worships the gallows upon his father was hanged. Uh, in another video I made the point that when you put a cross around your neck as a sign that you are being a Christian, you can also put a, I don't know, little model of an electric chair about, uh, around your neck because the cross is only the means by which Jesus Christ was killed. He was nailed upon the cross so that was the quote-unquote weapon they used to kill him. Yeah? Like hanging a gun around your neck or a knife or an electric chair, or the gallows. Yeah? You don't worship the gallows because your father was hanged there. You worship the father. And I'm not speaking about your carnal father, I'm speaking about your heavenly father. So this is a very important little sentence, that the cross of Christ ought not to be adored, because no man worships the gallows upon which his father was hanged. As to the human soul, that souls were spirits banished from heaven because of their sins. 
These are said to be the principles of the Albigenses, and they will all appear in the sentence pronounced against Stefana de Pruado, which I shall here give at large, from the book of the sentences of the Inquisition at Toulouse. And this, my dear brothers and sisters, is something that we will read next time. I think it was quite a journey to go into all the dogmas of the Albigenses and see that these persecuted people, who are a remnant of the true Church of God in the south of France, in Piedmont, in that time, also had their mistakes in dogma. They did not completely adhere to the Bible, because what we just read, and I think I maybe even reread this next time and go a little bit more into it. I think the last 15 minutes that I read were all apostate points. If the Albigenses held to that belief, they are not inspired by the Bible. They are absolutely not inspired by the true word of God. That at least is as far as I can see it and say it my opinion. And of course everybody is free to make his opinion known in the, in the comment section of the video. So let me hear what you think about this. But what the Albigenses said here as their belief system, what was their quote-unquote confession of faith, I absolutely do not agree with. So I'm going to end this reading right here and we will continue next time in this paragraph, in this 8th chapter, the persecution of the Valdenses and Albigenses. And uh, see next time where, we, where this chapter, where this book takes us in the history of the Inquisition from Philip van Limborch. I thank you very much for watching and listening and commenting. And until next time, may God bless you. Jogla 66 from War on Disinformation, Hour of the Truth, signs off saying bye-bye. We must start at the foot of the cross. For our souls in danger, we're at loss. And when we kneel in that awesome place, at that very moment, you'll feel God's grace. Friend, let me tell you, you need to know, there is heaven, also hell below. Christ died on that cross to set you free from your vile sins and hell's agony. You're God's enemy without the cross. Reject Christ and to God your dross. To the prison of hell he will send, just Christ's work on the cross makes amends. God hates those who try to enter in, the gates of heaven still full of sin. Only his son can take sin away, go to the foot of the cross, this day. God has provided only one way to enter heaven's wondrous array. Except what Jesus did for us all, he paid our debt, so hell won't befall. Go to the foot of the cross this day, his precious blood washes sin away. We each need to think more of his cross, Without our Savior, we're total lost.